Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher, and we are at episode 99. It's just fun to know we are almost at 100 episodes. And just a side note on podcasts, I was reading a statistic report on Apple Podcasts, and they said it's the biggest industry boom since really streaming music. But they said most podcasts only last seven episodes. So I get that. I mean, it seems like a good idea. Then some people realize that they either don't have the time, the money, the topics or ideas to keep it going. I actually surprised myself that I've been able to come up with so many different topics and that they're all different. Sometimes there's slightly uh, some crossover, but for the most part, I've tried to make them all different for you. But we're going to keep doing this as long as you want to listen in. I love the platform and it's been not only fun for me, but kind of an outlet to really just get some things out there that may or may not be politically correct, but they're all about correct coding, correct reimbursement and billing and compliance and just hopefully giving you some insight and some inspiration on how you can uh, make your job in healthcare uh, better for you. And, and hopefully it's helpful. Actually, one thing I wanted to shout out a company that I actually kind of have laughed at. It is the Coding Institute newsletter, and it's the Practice Management Alert. And I'm a board member on them. They call us inter, um, advisory board members. So we basically, you know, read through and if we see any errors, we let them know. But it comes out as a coding alert. And there's also some specialty uh, alerts as well, some specialty coding alerts. But I laugh because every time I get an, uh, a, it's something they mail to you. So it's a, a basically a newsletter they mail to you. Every time I pick up an issue, I'm like, oh, that topic sounds familiar. And sure enough, it was my podcast within the last month. So they didn't really ask me to do that. <laughs> but I guess I should appreciate the uh, the, the shout out and uh, the fact that they actually write it up exactly how my uh, podcast is. The only thing I wanted to correct them on since I don't, I haven't said anything for a while is they say they reference me as uh, owner of Terry Fletcher Consulting and also a, a podcaster at CodeCast. So there's no CodeCast company. This is the CodeCast podcast through my company. So I just thought I'd put that out there. I just thought it was funny. But uh, if you get, ever get any um, copies of that newsletter, you will see that some of the episodes are basically written up in there. So um, shout out to them. I just think it's it's <laughs> it was just funny to me when I keep seeing that. I'm like, wait, I know that. But at least they give you the reference. Okay, so today, what are we going to talk about? Well, last week, I gave you some insight and said that we need to really address miscellaneous services. Can you bill for them? And also, I wanted to bring you the latest survey results from Medical Economics on the top ranked physician electronic health record systems. So I know many of you purchased your EMRs or EHRs when CMS was putting a lot of pressure on you to get one, basically saying that you were going to get fined or there was going to be some meaningful use money you weren't going to get if you didn't um, engage in a practice management system or a electronic health record system. And you really didn't have a lot of choices back then. And I've noticed that a lot of you lately are now changing or upgrading your systems, and you really need to know what the reviews are out there. So I'm going to talk about that uh, later today. So let's first talk about miscellaneous services and get into what that actually means from a um, go coding and billing standpoint. So tucked away in the back of the CPT book, there are certain add-on codes, and add-on codes have plus signs in front of them that can help explain and encounter special or extenuating circumstances. And if you look back at the uh, where these codes are, they're listed in under miscellaneous services. They're way in the back of your CPT book. They start at 99050 and go up to 99060. And there's only a handful of codes. They're, they really focus on after hours, emergency services, and things like that. And I understand that after hours healthcare services, they can improve revenue on, in some instances and increase satisfaction among patients, office staff, and physicians. But these are especially relevant in primary care and pediatric practices because children's in illnesses and injuries always seem to occur at odd times and usually after business hours. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that payer cooperation is crucial to enhancing patients' access to after-hours care. But to get paid for these services, you should also be aware that these specific add-on codes, you may have to do some kind of a contract negotiation in the future to make sure that 
they get paid. Otherwise, it's going to be a problem. So a couple of things as far as reimbursement first. So CMS, so Medicare, considers reimbursement for the code range I just gave you, 99050, 99051, 99053, 99056, 99058, and 99060. They are bundled into the payment of other services provided on the same date. So with Medicare, you're not going to get anywhere. But other payers, such as United Healthcare and a couple of other payers, which I'll mention, um, they are reimbursing separately for other services, specifically the 99050 and 99051. But there are certain guidelines that cross over to make sure that you can get additional compensation. But they're only paying primary care for providers. And who are primary care providers according to the payers? Adolescent medicine, pediatric adolescent, pediatrics, um, family nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner, pediatric nurse practitioner, uh, advanced registered nurse practitioner. So these are all NPs, basically. Family practice, general practice, geriatric medicine, gynecology, obstetrics, and, and uh, obstetrics and gynecology. That's all considered to be family practice as well. Internal medicine, and then a certified nurse mid midwife. So if you're a specialty of GI, or and you're not an internal medicine physician, or your cardiology, or your ENT, or general surgery, these will not apply to you because they just won't allow it. Now you may. Be be able to directly contract with some payer that's saying that, well, I see patients, you know, after hours, but it's tough to get them paid. So the codes I want to specify are 99050, and that says services provided in the office at times other than regularly scheduled office hours or days when the office is normally closed, so holidays, Saturdays, or Sundays, in addition to basic service. And then 99051, services provided in the office during regularly scheduled evening, weekend, or holiday hours in addition to the basic service. But let me explain what that is when we get there. So again, only authorized for primary care providers. Providers still will be able to bill for your ENM code, of course. But the intent of these codes, okay, so you need to know that so that when you are trying to negotiate any kind of payment uh, with a commercial plan, that you can give support on why you want to bill for them. But the intent is to change of these codes is to encourage the expansion of office hours to evenings, holidays, and weekends, and reduce the need for a Medicaid beneficiary or because they're looking to possibly cover it or a commercial plan patient to seek services in the emergency room. Now, just a kind of a back step a little bit, South Carolina Medicaid, uh, Florida Medicaid, and Where's my other one? Uh, Maine Medicaid. They actually do cover the, those two codes I mentioned. Um, of the plans that will allow these these services, here's the interpretation of how CPT defines the 99050, for example. So this means that all patients scheduled outside published business hours, this would not include a visit that was scheduled at 4 p.m., and the patient was not seen by the physician until 6.30, so for uh, 99051, the payer defined evening hours to be any time after 6 p.m. or before 8 a.m. Weekends are defined as Saturday 8 a.m. to Monday 8 a.m. And providers may only bill for the following federal holidays. So New Year's Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Um, no Groundhog Day, people. <laughs> holidays are defined as 8 a.m. in the morning of the holiday until 8 a.m. the following morning. And after hours procedure codes are not uh, covered when the service is provided in an uh, emergency department, in an inpatient hospital, outpatient hospital setting, or urgent care facility. So if you're dealing with place of service 20, 21, 22, and 23, these services will not be covered no matter what. Now the reimbursement for these codes, you know, really don't get too excited. $12. Do you notice how Medicare does that? Medicare likes $12 for some reason. There is a generic code, I should have said a G code for um, an extremity angiogram with a heart cath, $12.80. There, the moderate sedation code add-on codes uh, are $12.53. And now we have a $12 code for some after hours or evening codes possibility. But if you're not sure what warrants the using them, make sure you do check with your local payers because some may add a holiday or not. But it's really important that you understand that um, they're, they may not be covered. So here's an example of 99050 versus 99051. 
So a practice is posted hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The office closes, but the physician receives a phone call at 5 p.m. from a patient that their child is sick, and the physician decides to stick around and have the mom bring the child in, and they see the patient at 545. That would be a 99050 in addition to your E&M service, but again, you have to make sure the payer is going to pay it or it will be patient responsibility. Also, do not report the 99051 um, if the physician or other qualified healthcare professional is running late and seeing the patient during evening hours. And so be, be careful on that 99051. Now, 99058, this is provi- it says provided on an emergency basis in the office, which disrupts other scheduled office services in addition to the basic service. So reported when the condition of a patient requires immediate attention of the provider. So for an example, would be maybe an asthma attack or a seizure. And the provider has to stop what they're doing to attend to the patient. And of course, you would have to support medical necessity. This is not for patients where you fit into the schedule or siblings that you see during the same encounter. So this code, even though Medicare doesn't um, pay for it, I've seen a couple of plans that will reimburse uh, $20 extra for this code. So it's a patient, let's say, that presents for a very uh, acute office visit. The nurse checks in the patient and notices that the patient seems very weak and pale. And as she leaves the room to say that the patient's ready, the patient faints. So she goes into another exam room, calls the doctor to come out immediately, disrupting the office schedule because a physician has to now go into that room and spend a great deal of time with the patient, possibly call 911 to get them admitted. So you would get 99058 in addition to any other services. But make sure that you are looking at what your Um, your payers are going to allow because 99051 and 99050, they're add-on codes to E&M services and you may not get that payer that will uh, pay for it. So keeping in mind that the appointment starts, if it starts during business hours and ends after hours, that doesn't qualify for these codes. Also, insurance companies are not required to reimburse for these visit extras unless your contract specifically says it will. So if it's not in the contract and the claim is rejected, you could try to negotiate new terms or lobby for reimbursement. But let's talk about this for a second. Uh, When you're dealing with these services, you have to make sure that um, you are acting in good faith. So it means that when you submit a claim to an insurance company, you expect to get paid. It's not that you hope to get paid, you expect to get paid, meaning that you expect to get paid from anybody, either the payer or the patient. And if it's a non-covered service, that means it's patient responsibility. I'm not saying a bundled service, I'm saying a non-covered service. That's now transferred to the patient for for a payment. If you try and write it off as a denial, you basically told the insurance carrier that the service did not really have value, was not medically indicated or necessary and you only build them to see if it would get paid so on how many levels is that bad faith and potentially fraudulent so you have to be careful with that um, I noticed that a lot of times physicians will come in actually I was at a client office yesterday and the doctor said hey I heard that I could bill for uh, remote codes now it doesn't matter place of service I'm like that's not true there's one code that a uh, Medicare is now allowed and we know that's the virtual check-in which I've talked about recently But doctors sometimes will come in and they'll say, hey, I was told by another physician or colleague that we can bill for this. Why aren't we? Make sure make sure that you are researching this first, that you are doing your due diligence and then respond because you don't want to add it on or just bill it for the sake of billing it. And then make sure that you're if you're going to look at these after hours um, services, make sure that your regular hours of operation are clearly stated on your website, on your door, on your signage, on any marketing materials, because this helps make your case to the insurance company for extra reimbursement when you see a patient outside of your regular hours. There was an article in Physicians Practice recently that said third party insurers may allow additional reimbursement for after hour services if the physicians can prove to them that it's in their best interest. So the report recommended that these strategies to get paid for services are provided during non-traditional business hours. So how are you negotiating your contract? Basically, you can negotiate payment um, as part of the contractual agreement, showing them that it's a cost-saving service for them, that the patient could have been sent to the emergency department instead of being treated in your office for after business hours, but that the cost of ED services is so much higher than comparable primary care services. 
And then if you are going to do that, remember when you're reporting it, um, you can show that there is a comparison there in your practice. And it just, you want to just make sure that you're using uh, someone to give you information on these services in your office that has researched it. So tag one of your certified coders or one of your billers that has been there, you know, 10 years and say, hey, I have a project for you. You know, find this out for me. Find out which of our payers, our top payers, will pay for this. Find out if you're taking uh, Medicaid in your state, if that's something that you can bill for. But make sure that you do research before that because I've seen so many practices start to bill this, get a ton of denials. It inflates your AR and then they don't think that they have to um, let the patient know that it's their responsibility. And we just don't want to go there. We always want to make sure that we are um, doing our due diligence. Otherwise, that can be a problem. Okay, so our coding question today comes from one of my new Guam clients, and it's actually a management question about being a coder. So let's look at this. It says, Terry, I'm currently a practice manager, but I'm thinking of seeking the credentials to specialize in medical coding so I can look for a job that is remote. What is the market outlook on medical coding jobs, and will there still be jobs by the time I'm certified? Okay, so from beginning to end, if you are not a seasoned coder, meaning you don't, you're not certified, but you have skills in coding that you've been doing it a long time, but you just you haven't um, actually taken the test, it'll take you. So you're not as let's say that's not you. You're somebody that basically oversees coders, but you don't really get into the coding. It'll take you a little time because coding is not just. A secretarial position. It's something that you have to understand anatomy, physiology, physician language, you know, this code description also means this. So um, just from a simple answer to your question, the U.S. Department of Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that employment of medical coders is expected to grow 13 percent from 2016 to front to 2026 and that's faster than the average occupation but remember the median act, uh, annual wage for coders is around 40,350 a year so that was as of may 2018 i've seen it go up slightly i think about 42 but you want to if you're going from a management position you have to know that you're looking at a significant decrease in your uh, income. And so many coders that this uh, income survey was done, they worked in an office, but some were remote. And if you work remotely, you are going to be a little bit lower. So be aware that's kind of the, the median right now for that. Um, but that's a good question. It's just kind of interesting that management, since I was talking about uh, coding to start with. Our coding question was brought to you today by Sirius XM Radio, Dr. Radio Channel 110. Check it out live or on demand. Download the Sirius XM app today. You also may hear me on the Interventional Cardiology Show. I give my quick hits uh, once or twice a month and just some coding tips uh, on the doctor's channel. So check it out today. Okay, so now let's look at EMRs. And it seems like I'm whipping through things today pretty quickly, which is good. It's really warm in my office. You might hear the fan in the background. But and I apologize for that, but it is warm in here. Every year, Medical Economics uh, asks physicians to rate their EHR system and use their practice um, on a number of factors, ranging from usability to customer service. So there was a compiled results of over a thousand physicians. This was published in late 2019 and just uh, or late 2018 and just updated uh, in March. And so these are the top nine systems based on physician feedback. And it also includes the area the system scored best and worst on and how many physician users provided scores for each system. Um, one thing that's kind of funny, have you ever tried to write EHR in a Word document? It keeps changing it to her. It hates that acronym. Drives me crazy. Just see little stuff. So that's why I like podcasts. I can just go off on a tangent. And you guys are like, okay, she needs some more coffee. Okay, so these are not de definitive guidance. This is really just results from physicians and rankings, but they do offer a snapshot of physician opinions on the various health, um, electronic health record systems that are available. So the first one is office practicum. So highest rating, vendor's ability to resolve technical problems, and the lowest rating, importing data into the EHR. So this results this result was based on 447 physician users. And then practice fusion, highest rating, ease of navigation through patient visit, 
lowest rating amount of training pra- of the, for the practice that they received on the electronic health record system. And that was based on 143 physicians. So basically, they, they thought it was easy to navigate, but there wasn't a lot of training. And so that could be just something you want to keep in mind. Uh, modernizing medicine. Now, I've actually never seen this system, so this is interesting. Highest rating ease of moving from one section of the EHR to another. Lowest rating speed of moving to backup systems when main system is interrupted. Okay, and that was about 152 doctors. E clinical works, ease of navigation through the patient visit. And then the lowest rating was importing data into their EHR. Now, eClinical Works has been in the news a lot lately, too, because they said that they were certified and authenticated for MIPS and MACRA, and they weren't. So make sure that if you have the new and improved eClinical Works, that they have gotten certified for the system that you have. Epic, everybody knows Epic. Ease of moving from one section of the EHR to another. The lowest rating, ease of customization or configuration of the EHR to meet your practice needs. This was 188 users. Yeah, this one is tough because Epic is basically what everybody went to to start. And I do see some practices saying, oh, we're moving to Epic, Epic, but a lot of practices are saying we're getting out of Epic. And so this would be interesting to see what you think if you're an Epic user. Next Gen. Now, this is probably the one I'm most familiar with. A lot of practices have Next Gen. I think there's a lot of clicks that have to be on Next Gen, but it's not too bad. Uh, the highest rating quality of training your staff practice received. They do focus a lot on, on training, and it's also one of the more expensive programs out there. And then lowest rating speed of moving to backup system when main system is interrupted. I work a lot of, um, I don't I shouldn't say I work remotely because I work for myself. But when I do a lot of audits, I access remotely. And so I get into the system. The IT sets me up and I'm able to access remotely. And that lowest rating is absolutely accurate. When they're working on backing up or the main system's interrupted for something that's happening on the mainframe, and I'm trying to get into it on a on, on off hours or anything, it kicks me out. So that, that was a, a problem for me. It's been better, but it, it definitely can be an issue. All scripts. I, all scripts is good. All scripts is pretty basic, but you have to keep clicking to get to a screen. Amount of training your practice received on EN, uh, EHR is the highest rating. Lowest rating, frequency of useful pop-ups and alerts, and how many clicks it takes to get to the patient screen. So that was definitely, they agreed with me on that one. So let's take a look at the next one. So number eight is Athena Health. Highest rating, ease of navigation through patient visit. Lowest rating, ease of customization or configuration of the EHR to meet your practice needs. Athena Health has also been in the news. Um, it's basically because there was some problem with interfacing with the practice management system and also with making sure that uh, patients who were scheduled or there was something that put in the system for a lab test that there was follow through that actually went to the person who needed to schedule it. So the interfacing was a, a big red flag there. And that was 144 users. And then uh, Cerner, highest rating amount of training your practice received on, e on your EHR. And then their lowest rating was the importing of data into the EHR. And that was 54 users. So there's good, th good and bad with every system. Uh, it just depends what you want to look at. But again, you want to be able to know what are the top nine in case you're looking to make a change or if basically you're, you just didn't know what was out there. So uh, that hopefully if you listen back to this, you can see what system would be uh, the most effective for you. So hopefully you found that to be good information. Okay, so today I want to end with my personal insight this week. One of the things I bought when I was in or bought for um, Hawaii was my new Kindle. I don't know if anybody has the new Kindle. It's so light. I keep dropping it. I mean, it, it is like this, this square disc that is half the size of a mini iPad. And it's, it's, I would say half the more than half the weight of your phone. It's so light. It's great. And it has non glare, you can bring it anywhere Just slide it into your purse or pocket. And now I'm kind of downloading books like crazy. But right now I'm reading Jackie Collins, the last book before she passed away, the Santangelo. So if you ever were a Jackie Collins fan, which I've been over the last 25 years, uh, that crime and Hollywood family is finally coming to an end. And then I'm also reading this new, uh, it's a two book series. And it's called Confessions of a Red Herring. It is hilarious 
hilarious. It's corporate, cor- corporate corruption and murder at its best. And it's told in a hilarious way. I can't stop laughing, but there are, are there are also some nail biter parts. So check it out. It's by Dana Dratch and uh, it's a two book series. The next one is seeing red that follows it. So anyway, hopefully you'll appreciate that if you're a reader and if you're not a reader, why don't you think about it? You know, just basically lose yourself in a book. When somebody said to me, well, I did in a, uh, in an audiobook, you know, get back to reading. Audiobooks are great if you've got a, you know, a 10 hour drive or a four hour drive somewhere. But get back to reading. It's, it's actually and, and leisure reading, not just reading manuals and medical publications like I do, I have to force myself to read it just um, just kind of can lose yourself in it. And it gives you kind of a mind vacation. All right, everyone. So that's it for me today. Make it a great day and a great week. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>